background in entertainment technology, media, and marketing to create new possibilities and products. When he is not managing a client's vision for emerging technologies, lecturing at a university, or appearing on a television or radio station, Andrew spends his time building experiments, developing new products, and driving conversations online. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Andrews. And last but not least, we have Asosa Igadara. She is the founder of Cosign Inc. She has a platform that allows you to shop any of your products across all of your social medias. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Asosa Igadara. All right, guys, so let's get started. First and foremost, I'm gonna let you guys jump a little bit further into your backgrounds. So let's start with Tanisha. Tell me a little bit about your background and how you got involved in your sector. Okay. Hi guys. Um, for over 15 years, I have been working um, in the area of grassroots organizing and minority women in business outreach. Um, I realized that as women of color, that there needs to be a voice in New York City. And that voice has not been heard on multiple levels. It's only been heard on this level, which is like the local level. But when it comes to government, it needs to be heard and heard on this level. So I've been able to do that on many opportunities by working in government as the first executive director for the New York State Senate conference of black senators, helping with the passage of Article 15A amendments, and then also working in the private sector, as you alluded to, with being the first woman to launch MWBE Connect NY, which is a mobile app to help entrepreneurs such as yourself find city and state contracts all in one place. Beautiful. All right, James, tell us about Smashed. Yeah. So Smashed is a consultancy. Um, we have two North Stars that we sort of have built our business and our consultancy around. One is uh, emerging trends in culture. Uh, so we look at the world through the eyes of where the world's going in terms of culturally. And the other trend we look at is uh, the trend of, of emerging technologies. And so we help uh, clients think about the future, We're really futurist at, at best. Um, we're a baby, sort of a joint venture baby between a venture capital firm, uh, early stage investor called Adam Factory, run by my partner Troy Carter. Uh, we've invested in 100 companies, Uber, Spotify, Lyft, Warby Parker, some of the big ones you know about. Um, and then we're also part of Havas, which is a big advertising uh, company based in Paris. So we sit in the sort of intersection of tech culture hustle, is what we like to say. Uh, we, we're in Los Angeles, uh, which I think right now feels like the future. Uh, living in, in, Cal in LA feels like living in the future in many ways. Um, and so my work is really uncovering and unpacking what's happening next, and we're really obsessed right now with cities. So we, we spend a lot of time in cities, Detroit, Atlanta, uh, you know, Miami, um, now London, Nigeria, uh, Dubai, so forth, uncovering the role of cities in innovation. So it's, it's really special. Awesome. And you're being really humble. So what about your background? How did oh, you get involved? In yeah, so that? my background. So I grew up uh, in the record business. I used to make people famous the old-fashioned way. So I worked at Sony Music, came up through hip-hop. Uh, in the 90s, I was, you know, working on Fuji's, Nas, Kenny Lattimore, Maxwell. Um, and started my career off like many of us young folk who in the when we were in our 20s, overpaid salaries for doing something I do for free. Um, and it was an incredible run in the 90s. Uh, I built my first website in 99, sold it to a dot com. We raised $40 million through rounds of funding. Um, it was called uh, UBO, Urban Box Office. Uh, and then I moved to Atlanta and really kind of restarted my career and worked in the agency world and built a social media agency in 2010 that I sold in 14. Um, and, uh, you know, have been in innovation tech. Uh, ever since and so I kind of sit in this interesting space of my old life or my current life or my always life because like the mob was celebrity and uh, entertainment um, and, and my new life which is not my old life because I grew up in Palo Alto and went to high school across from Stanford uh, which is tech so it's, it's an interesting time that we live in today. Beautiful and Isosa tell us about Cosign and why you decided to get involved in the social media space. Yeah so my company is Cosign 
Cosign is the first mobile app to allow users to tag product information within images they share on social media. And so now your friends and followers can literally tap to buy any of the products found in your post. And when they do, we get a commission as a company and we share it with you, the content creator. So you earn money for yourself, you type of thing. We thought it was a cool way to recommend products through your images and posts so that um, folks can finally figure out what those brands are. And one of the reasons why we started this company is that we realize social media is like everything right now for people. That's where they get their news. That's where they're finding out what's happening in their communities or locally, local news. Um, and then also that's how people are discovering products. I would often find myself while working uh, in corporate. I used to work in banking at, at Citigroup for seven years before I started this. And um, I would always find and discover cool, the latest trends or the latest products. And I'm like a trend junkie when it comes to like what's in. And so I would want to figure out where to buy those items. It was so hard. Can you imagine like looking at an item and see, oh, where do you even begin to figure out where that product is, that red bag, that purple lipstick, or whatever it is. Um, and so that's how we decided to kind of get into this space of, being the missing, uh, being the link between uh, commerce and social media, because social media has been around forever now, right? Over 10 years, but you still can't shop through it, right? That seems like a backwards thing. Like you should be able to do that now, and so we're hoping to build, uh, you know, fill that void. Beautiful. So I know you guys want to talk about obviously trends. We're going to talk about branding first, so everybody's on the same page in terms of what they need to do. Because if you don't have your brand together, then your trends don't matter. So we're going to dive into that first. So specific to branding, have you guys seen any branding mistakes that stick out for you guys with your clients? Yeah, I think it's really critical um, that every company understands their why. And what I mean by their why, if any of you are Simon Sinek fans, one of my favorite TED Talks is Simon Sinek's talk around finding your why, finding your, your real purpose. Um, I think for so many organizations, um, because what happens is they jump to social media and you think that's, that's a tactic, that's not your why. Um, and it's really critical that before you start having communication with the customer, before you start actually um, talking, and, and you know, it, that you understand um, you know, what problem in the world you're trying to solve. Like, so if you're an entrepreneur out there and you're building a company, what's the problem in the world that you're trying to solve and why are you the most qualified to solve it? And so um, that's really what entrepreneurship is. It's we're, we're a bunch of um, crazy, insane people who've decided to take this thing on um, to solve for X. And so I think it's really important that you understand what you're, you know, what you're solving for, why, why you're qualified to solve that. And then, and then we can get to social media, right? And then we can get to communication, PR, communication, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and I think the mistake that I see is an is a incongruency, is sort of a disconnect between what you really are about, what your brand is about, and what you reflect and what you say to your customers. And so um, we spend a lot of time with big Fortune 500 clients and startups. Um, and they both have very similar challenges in that they have not spent the time to unpack and uncover that really unique thing. And they come to me and they go, I want to be at South by Southwest. You know, I want to be viral. I want to go viral. I want to do this, right? But like, you don't even know what your, you know, who your customers are, why they should care about you, what's the truth, what's the tension, what's the opportunity, all those sort of things. And I think, you know, um, if you're not hiring us, then you should definitely take the time to really go through an exercise where you really uncover and un unleash um, your why, and then from there you can get into like who your archetypes and who your personas are and who the right, who the right customers are. Um, and the other thing is, is just, again, I, the mistake I see a lot of is that most small businesses think tactically. They think, oh, if I just grow followers on social media, I'll do this, right? Or if I just get on YouTube, or if I just, you know, but that's actually a tactic, that's not your strategy. And so it's really important to, to know the difference between using the tools and actually having a strategic uh, intent behind why you do it. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with them. Um, from, from my aspect as a consultant at Capolino, um, we have like a 10 step that we tell small businesses starting out as entrepreneurs. One is research. And that research consists of what James was saying, what is your business, but also who are your competitors in that space? 
What are they doing that makes you different from them? The second piece is understanding your business, making sure that you have that elevator pitch that is straight, fast, and direct. If your elevator pitch is not there, then you're not gonna be able to brand your business to be able to talk about it. Because in this space that we're in, you only have a certain amount of time when you meet someone to be able to pitch what your business is. So you have to be able to be able to speak about your business at a level that's communicable and understandable and gets a message to that person where they need to follow up with you. The other piece is knowing who can benefit from your business. A lot of people don't realize that people are, have businesses that government is actually interested in. And that's where I come into this. A lot of people don't realize that city and states have business opportunities and procurements that are out there for toilet paper. How many of you guys knew that you could actually, if you're a supplier, you can actually win a bid for toilet paper? And only one person, two people? How many people actually know that if you're in the fashion industry, you can actually win a bid with a city or state to do their fashion week? How many people knew that? One, two, three. How many of you know that you could actually sell gum to your state? Gum. Wow. One person. It's absolutely amazing to know that as an entrepreneur, that you don't know what your city or your state is actually looking for in terms of business opportunities. That is one of the biggest mistakes that I see from my clients is that they have a business and they don't know that it's marketable to government or to the city. So when you're doing your business, you really need to know exactly who you're marketable to on all levels, not just private sector, but government sector as well, because that will help you with sustaining your business for a period of time that you may not realize. So that's the biggest mistake that I see. Don't we, uh, just to add to that, because a lot of great things were said, is that value proposition is so important just to have a crisp understanding of what you do, um, but also coupled with why you should care, right? Um, I think a lot of what nonprofits do really well is they can tell you the mission, right? Why you should care about what this nonprofit does, but sometimes it's harder to like make a living, right? Make a non-profit sustainable if you don't have a sustainable business uh, model within it. But um, with businesses, you always can answer what your business does, but you don't always can, you can't always answer why people should care. So really try to understand that why value proposition and tailor it, your message first before kind of um, sharing with people because then they'll know the one-two punch of what you do and why you're with you. Because again, again, what social media does for people is just organize the tribes and how you wanna to communicate to your tribe. It's like talking to your friend or family. They get it because you guys have similar interests and sim similar kind of things that you guys are into, so it's easier to kind of talk to that. You're speaking their language, so they get it. So when they fall into that problem, it's easy just to think of you because duh, who else am I gonna go to? Of course, I've been listening and talking to you all this time on social media because you're able to articulate that very clear. Beautiful, so now that we talked about the mistakes, let's talk about how your guys' products and services help to correct those mistakes. So let's start with James. How is Smash helping to correct those branding mistakes that you spoke about? Yeah, so the two things that we see um, and sort of led to the value prop. Um, I thought I think that was really important um, when we started the company. Um, and I inherited a business that had been focused on influencer marketing, right? So I'm gonna give you the whole story. And I was like, that's a silly business. Like, who wants to be in that business? And so I, um, I took the R off of it and I said, actually, the business will be in is influence and recognize that as urban culture, um, as people of color, we actually drive influence. We drive trends, we drive everything globally. And so I've rebuilt a Booz Allen McKenzie-like business that focuses um, on, on influence and cultural impact. Um, and we do that on the investment side. So we invest in, you know, you know Deshaun, you know, f uh, all these amazing entrepreneurs, some of them women, some of them African-American. But we also um, 
come from hip hop. So I understand bottom up marketing. I understand uh, trends and understand how to look at the future and like figure out how to leverage trends into our business. And so for us, you know, we are working with um, companies that uh, may be thinking about, okay, I'm putting four stores in Los Angeles. Well, how do I leverage Los Angeles? What's my, you know, what do I, what do I sound like? What do I, what do I look like in, in, on the west side versus, you know, Silver Lake? And in order to do that, you have to know the borough. You have to know the streets. You know, and, and coming from hip hop, what was wonderful is, again, bottom up marketers. I could go into any city in the country. I know St. Louis, I know Detroit, I know Oakland, I know all these great cities. And most importantly, because I'm in the cities, I know the heartbeat of the city. So we launched a tour uh, where it's called Culture and Code, where we go to cities. And really, if you could look at a city through the lens of a, a developer and contractor, uh, look, at the, look at the city through a, um, a big private equity person, um, or look at the city through a graffiti artist. How would those three individuals look at the city of Miami, which I just left, right? And we have Wynwood, which is gentrifying. What's the next Wynwood, right? And so for us, those are decisions vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, you know, where we're gonna build something that affect culture, affect the community, and affect where you should be building your business, where you should be building your footprint. And so I think for us, people come to us because we know the streets, literally, the streets from Kenya to, to uh, you know, Wynwood in Miami. Um, but we also understand when you're gonna make an investment as a corporation, when you're gonna make an investment as a startup, um, how do you actually leverage the ecosystem? The ecosystem could be government. So I lived in Atlanta for 15 years, spent a lot of time in the mayor's office, spent a lot of time with the White House uh, in Atlanta. How do you actually leverage the opportunities within city, state, federal, um, but then how do you leverage the culture, whether it's Andre 3000 or Ludacris or Usher, how do you actually leverage that? And so each city has a unique DNA. Um, and so we're really specialists at helping um, brands understand how to leverage that, how to make investments, how to make investments in cities, how to make investments in their businesses and leverage what's there. So my big, you know, my big takeaway is the world is changing. I mean, we know this in this room because we're black people, but for them out there, um, they don't understand that uh, the actual uh, understanding of our culture globally is everything. If you don't have a cultural strategy, you're losing. And so we're really, really good at like being very nice about this, by the way, you know, being very tactful, you know, helping them get this, but like, it is not a nice to have. It is the future of your business. And so we believe in innovation. We believe in things like VR, AR, AI, you know, we play with all these things, but we, we think just as important as, as, as all those technologies, we believe that culture also is a huge innovation opportunity for, for, for our clients. That's awesome. Tanisha? So, we, so I co-created MWBE Connect um, as being a model and a tool for New York State and New York City. Um, what we did basically is we wanted to streamline where entrepreneurs and minority businesses are finding contracts by putting it all on your phone. So it cuts down on the amount of time. It cuts down on the amount of research you have to do to actually find contracts that match your capabilities. We do it for you. How many of you guys actually use your phone to do your banking? Raise your hand. How many of you guys actually use your phone to spy on your kids or your girlfriends or your boyfriends? You don't have to raise your hand on that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on. No it's shame. Half the room. How no many shame. of you guys actually use your phones to start your cars, set your alarms? You know. Now, here's a good one. How many of you actually use your phones for business opportunities? Brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Now, how many of you guys actually use your phones to make those business opportunities happen? Oh my God, th this just warms my heart. This really warms my heart. So MWBE Connect actually takes it a step further. We not only help you find the contracts, but we also provide you with announcements, events that are upcoming so that you can track it, monitor it, and also be able to apply for it as well. So that way you don't have to run to your home computer to download it. We actually are giving you the information right on your mobile phone. So for us in New York City, an RFP or request for a proposal is sometimes like 357 pages. 
and the title doesn't tell you exactly what it is. So you literally will have to go to your computer and print it out to read the darn thing to see if it actually meets your capabilities. Well, guess what? We figured out a way to do that by retagging it by your profile so that you're only seeing the actual RFPs that are based on your business opportunities. So that's how we're kind of streamlining that trend so that entrepreneurs are actually spending less time doing the research piece of it and actually spending more time looking at real contracts that apply to them so that they can have the business opportunities. The other piece is we've leveraged it so that the private sector can get involved too. So if there's private companies out there that actually want to be able to find you guys, now they can actually promote their contracts on the app so that you can find them. Because how many times do you guys really know what's actually out there? You have to do the research, right? And that takes hours, especially when it comes to private sector. So because there's so many different things going on and so many different social media outlets out there, we kind of wanted to streamline it to make it a little bit easier so that the focus is more on your business and you and less time on the research component. So that's how we kind of leverage and help out, is by making life a little bit simpler and a little bit more of an investment for you and your business from a marketing standpoint, a business perspective, and also a mental standpoint, because you can really go crazy trying to find a lot of these contracts if you don't know what you're looking for or where to look. Awesome, Asosa? So with my company, I'm, I'm more of a C2C company, right? Because we, and I, and I say C2C because I'm saying customer to customer versus most of these businesses up here, they're B2B, they're selling to institutions or small business or medium-sized businesses. And for me, I'm trying to um, elevate everyday people's experiences on social media by allowing you to recommend the products within them, right? These are products that you do use every day, right? So you know them best, and people are already looking for these products. So I, I typically would try to market to folks. Um, my early adopters, which are essentially people who are more likely to use your product first, um, would be influencers and bloggers, right? Because they constantly, they've cultivated this audience of people who respect and, and want their opinion on things. So when they're taking a photo of their, you know, morning jog or whatever it is, they're at a conference, whatever, and people want to know what those products are, they would leverage my app in a way to do that. So you would simply download the app, it's free. You tag, you take a photo, tag anything in the photo. That could be your lipstick, toothpaste, <laughs> literally anything. But we do usually take it from a, a fashion and beauty perspective to allow people to tag their favorite shoes. And then when they post it, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, it becomes an, literally an interactive shoppable tool, right? So now that post, when a friend or follower sees it, they can literally tap to buy it, right? And see the product information in the post, taking them to the um, product page, and then when they buy it, that influencer gets a commission, right? So the, the cool thing about influencers, there are a ton of them, right? There's about 160 globally um, that are constantly creating content for people and they become their own channels, right? Um, and, but they, they too need a kind of tools to be able to kind of uh, share their experiences with their audiences and doing that easily. So we're first kind of focusing on that. And right now, um, the only way we interact with bigger businesses is to make sure the products that people are asking for are on the platform for you to tag. And so what we do right now, we have over 1,200 retailers and brands from Bloomingdale's to Macy's and the big giants to some smaller brands like um, Rebecca Minkoff or Chemical Shoes or whatever on the platform for people to tag. And that's equates over 25 million products um, that you can tag and share with your friends and followers. And so we just make that easier of a process for them. And, some, and now we literally just been asked to um, work with bigger brands to make that easier for them because they too with their audiences can't really share through, through visual content what the products are. And so we uh, try to kind of leverage our patent pending technology to allow the products and your images to be ready to buy as people are consuming it in the moment. And so that's a big part of kind of how we kind of uh, leverage our technology and uh, allow people to interact. 
Awesome. So now that you guys have heard about some of the mistakes that you can make on the branding side, you guys know some of the services and products that you could possibly use to avoid those mistakes. Let's jump into trends. So what are some of those trends that you guys are seeing from all of your perspectives with your products and services that people should probably start to follow? Well, I'll, I'll start. I think, I don't know if this is a trend or more of a point of view, but um, there's a book that was recently um, released called The Third Wave. It was written by Steve Case, who created AOL. Um, and what he talks about in, in, in the book, The Third Wave, is the idea that um, in the first wave, we built the internet, right? We know that. In the second wave, we built the mobile app economy. And in the third wave, um, the idea is that we're living in this, in this era of ubiquitous web, like this phone's going to talk to this bottle of water, and the bottle of water's going to talk to his tie, and his tie's going to tell me that we're friends on LinkedIn, and these glasses are going to let me know that we grew up in the third grade together, and we kicked it, and whatever. So... <laughs> The other thing that he <clears throat> proposes in this book is that we're going to solve for big problems, right? We're going to solve for healthcare, education, technology, through all these emerging technologies. And we are. We're living in some really amazing times. Um, and in many ways, we've been solving for privileged people problems, right? Airbnb, Uber, it's privileged people problem. Like, it's great, right? I can, My clients. Find, yes, awesome, your clients. <laughs> Things we've invested in. Amazing. So the, I see the trend for us is, like, how do you actually solve for tomorrow's X? Like, if you don't know tomorrow's day, if you've never, like, missed the bus or not had enough money to go to school or, or don't have access to light in, in Nigeria or whatever, like, uh, how do you actually solve for X if you don't know X? And I think the trend that we're seeing are entrepreneurs who are really spending time um, in communities um, solving for X. So I just joined um, Jessica Matthews' uh, advisory board. Jessica Matthews has a, an amazing company in Harlem. She's looking to become the first ever billion dollar company in Harlem. And she invented a soccer ball that when you kick, creates kinetic energy and then creates light. I'm sure she's been to this conference and probably spoke here. Um, and what I like about spending time with their team um, is the solving for X um, outside of America and thinking about um, where other markets are that you know, we can start to pilot ideas or, you know, and, and start to think about technology and its usage in greater ways, whether that's energy, which is what Jessica is doing. You know. um, but I think for me, the trends that, that we're really seeing are how do we, um, as entrepreneurs, solve for tomorrow's X? What, you know, what, what are the challenges out there that we, can, that we should be solving for? And maybe those challenges are in your community where you live, but maybe those challenges are actually in other markets around the world and what is our connectedness to Latin America, our connectedness to Africa, to other places and how do we leverage that advantage and how do we look at diasporic opportunities maybe um, a little differently. So that's kind of a trend and a point of view that, that we're looking at from an investment standpoint, what we invest in, what we're working on as consultants and just where I spend most of my time. I think for me, what I'm starting to see is that government is actually starting to pay attention to who you are. Um, and the way they're doing that is because there's been a number of increase of men and women of color getting certified as MWBEs. So they're starting to take a stronger and harder look at exactly what business opportunities are really out there. And they're starting to cater a lot of these contracts to your businesses. Um, in the city of New York especially, there was an uptake in a number of women-owned businesses that were certified and that actually received contracts with the city of New York and with the state of New York. Um, for the state of New York, it's a 30% MWBE goal participation requirement. I'm sorry, goal, not requirement. Um, and we saw there was a trend of more women businesses actually starting to get state contracts, you know, in the area of IT, architecture, construction. In the city, we saw that there was a major uptake of small businesses, especially um, of color in the areas of fashion, in the areas of general supply and demand, and then also in the area of just general basic consulting. It, and, you know, it's surprising that you know, a person who's a minority that's a consultant is not certified. You know, they would never think that their business could be helpful to the city. 
Here in Houston, um, I had the privilege of talking to quite a few um, certified MWBEs that are in the transportation business. And that's where there's a major uptake right here in the city of Houston. And there hasn't been a lot of MWBEs getting certified as transportation you know, specialists or, trans or drivers. You know? That's an area where there's money being left on the table, ladies and gentlemen. You know? We are one of the prime examples of leaving money on the table. We come up with these great ideas. We want to market it to people. We want to be able to showcase it, and we want to be able to talk about it. But we always forget where the money actually is. We spend so much time on putting our brands together and putting our websites together that we forget to look at who's actually going to give us the money to sustain it. Or am I right or am I wrong? I see some heads, I see some heads not shaking. How many of you guys actually ever thought about contracting with your local city or state government? How many actually have gone through the process to get certified? If you guys turn around, you should have seen how many hands went down and how many hands actually went up. If you are a small business, a minority, woman-owned business, you should be certified because there's opportunities out there and there's money being left on the table. Mm -hmm. And that trend is, starts with you because the only way that folks are gonna know what opportunities are out there in terms of businesses, yet that's your creations, is by you letting them know what your business is. I have a, a client um, who I love to death. She is a strategic engineer. Now, how many have ever heard of strategic engineer? Raise your hand. You're, oh, okay. You're an engineer, but are you a strategic engineer? <laughs> have you ever heard of a strategic engineer? Exactly. So I never knew what a strategic engineer was. So when she came to my office and said, you know, I need help getting certified in the city of New York and the state of New York, they don't know what I do. They don't know who I am. Can you help me? I said, first of all, what, what are you? Because <laughs> I've never heard of you. And then she went through the whole process of explaining to me what she does. And I had to say to her, OK, can you break it down for a seven-year-old to understand it? Because when you break it down for a seven-year-old to understand it, and don't, don't take this as offense, but then government will understand it. You know, Even though they write the RFPs, which we call requests for proposals or business opportunities in legalese, you know, they actually want you to dummy it down so that a seven-year-old can actually understand it. So after she dummied it down and I understood exactly what she was talking about, I said, oh my God. I said, there are so many different types of projects that are out there for you to be able to, you know, be out there doing your work on. So I took it upon myself to take a look at her website, take a look at what she did on, as her capability statement, remarketed her, you know, and then did the interviews with the city, and she got certified for the city and the state, and she now has a $3.2 million contract with the state of New York. So she knew there was an opportunity out there for her business. She knew that there was money being left on the table that she could actually grab. The question was, how does she go about getting it? She knew that she was going to need some help. And it's OK to ask for help. It's OK to find a consultant to help you if you don't have the capabilities to be able to do it yourself. And that's what she did. And now she has a five-year contract with the state of New York working on a project that's going to sustain her while she looks for other projects. So don't be afraid. Those trends, your businesses, can change the way people see things. Now, the government knows that she's out there. She's the only woman who's a strategic engineer. So guess what? She's going to get called for other contracts. Why? Because she changed the game. So if you want to be seen with the trends that are out there, you've got to know how to play the game and how to change the game so that it's marketable to you. Awesome, very, very good advice. Sosa? Yeah, just to piggyback off of what she just said, like, I also see a, another trend um, of like alternative ways of funding um, and getting grants or getting like uh, 
equity crowdfunded. Now, um, the laws have changed since I think mid last year that um, you can leverage an equity crowdfunding site to um, have people put as little as $100 to you know $5,000 from your friends and family and actually own equity in your company. That's a game changer, you know, like that hasn't happened before. So instead of just doing a Kickstarter and give them a hat, or a pair of shoes, so thank you for funding my idea, you can now you know, actually give them a piece of the equity and they can be a part of that long-term growth. So also a part of like the amount of grants you can get from the government. I'm a tech startup in fashion and social media. I found one grant the other day <laughs> and I was so shocked. I was like, I did not think they were gonna have anything for me, right? But we were dealing with you know, algorithms and ways to leverage, you know, social media and networks, right? The tech behind it is pretty powerful and they're, they want access to that. Just knowing that was like amazing. Um, so kudos to that. Um, the other piece I was gonna say, especially when it comes to my industry, influencer marketing, another game changer. It's been creeping for the last, how many, three, maybe four years. Um, of actually gaining people who align with your brand when you have your, the reason why, what you do and why you do it on, on tack, right? You find people who match that brand story and you align the, and you target their audiences through social media. Not only is this leveraged through big brands like the, you know, Wheat Thins we heard about or, you know, Coca-Cola or these huge brands, but it's really being leveraged by smaller mom and pops Right, people who are located in Florida, by the way, they can like, they know local celebrities that don't cost a lot of money compared to the, like getting a Usher or <laughs> whoever else to, to, to market and promote your brand. There are local celebrities that also have reach and you'll be able to kind of tap on that um, by kind of leveraging uh, these companies that make it affordable to do so. So I know there's a company like Instabrand or, um, AdMass and all these companies that literally align um, influencers with their product offering, whether it's a service or a brand. And that's been a big trend in the last couple of years, or like in the last year especially, because you're trying to get to that target group that speaks to your brand. And it's important to kind of align yourself in that way. And so I would say um, I've seen agencies do it as well. I've seen agencies literally turn their entire business to just influencer marketing because they've been able to make really good bets on it. Um, so making $50 million or more just on that alone for people posting, right? And kind of getting that uh, brand story out about your product or service. Awesome. So for all you guys who raised your hands earlier who have a business, are you guys interested in knowing like what trends you should be applying to your businesses? Okay, get up and go to those mics and let's start talking about it. <laughs> good afternoon, how you doing? Good. I was wondering, um, are you seeing anything for software as a service, meaning like any business intelligence tools? The question was around software as a service and intelligence tools? Correct, yes. Uh, and are we seeing uh, any trends within the, those, within that? Or you want tools? Yes, any the trends within that, either within um, our community or in the private corporations. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I know in New York, you know, there's been a lot of contracts out there in the security industry, um, especially after 9-11. Um, there was a huge trend of looking for, you know, new technology and software to be able to, you know, protect our, our databases and our systems. So there's always contracts out there, um, but they're more on a federal level than on a city and state level. Okay. So I would definitely say look at a lot what's on the US SBA site for those type of contracts. Are you certified? Uh, in the process. For state, federal? Um, for state. Okay, you should also get certified for federal. I think I have to do business, I think, for a year or two. Yes. Someone could uh, correct me, but I think we have to do business for two years before How we How long have you been in business? Um, four months. 
Okay. Yeah, so we got, you, I have a ways to go. You, but. you got some ways to go, but in that meantime, don't just sit and wait for the time to pass you by. Mm -hmm. You can start doing small contracts now, so you can start building your name and your brand and your business, so that when it is time for you to get certified on a city, state, and federal level, that you have some business experience as a company to be able to show them. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is my name is Uche Ogba. Thank you so much for all you guys' uh, education. I learned a lot today. Um, my company, is, we're a public relations firm, and we are state certified, and we're going through the process to get our 8A certification as we speak. But um, my question is for you, Tanisha. We have, 60% of our business is government contracting in the city of San Antonio, and we've been successful enough to gather and gain some of those winning contract bids, but we've started the process of moving to that next level where we're going for the $10 million, $15 million contracts. How do we present ourselves to the city to say we are viable? Because yes, uh, we make some fun money, but they see us more or less like we don't have the capacity to make that. And second of all, could we partner so we can bring that app to San Antonio? Because I, <laughs> we have like 500 different procurement sites that I have to go to to actually sift through um, uh, those bids to find it. Well, I, I'm actually working on making the app uh, national. Thank you. So, um, so stay tuned. Um, stay in touch. I will. Um, in terms of building your business to, and taking it to that next level so that they see you, have you built relationships yes. with so, them? Yes, we've built relations with procurement executives, but at that point, it's more or less the deciding factor of the individuals in the room that make that decision. So we've, we've and do you know them? We know a few of them. But, uh uh, but that's <laughs> not good. Yeah. You see, one of the tips that I tell everyone are the doors closed? Are you taping this? <laughs> it's okay. No, I'm being honest with you. Can I be honest? Okay. It's easier for a white man to get a contract and have no experience than a black man who's been in business over 10 years to get a contract. And the reason why the white man can get that contract is because he's done all the proper things to build that relationship. He knows their, the name of that person who's gonna sign off on it. He knows the wife, the kids. He's taken them out to dinner. He's had relationships with them outside of the office. You gotta, re, you gotta build that rapport. It sounds you know, cliche, but that's, the game of business when it comes to government. To any, not even just government. That's the game of my business. True, true. I'm playing you, that all day. Yeah, you got. You have to know who your players yeah, are and really all. know who your players are. It's not just they know the name of your company and no. they know who you are by face. No, they really need to know you. So you just have to take it to the next level of really being in their face for them to really know who you are and that you are really interested in taking your business to the next level. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and it's okay to be annoying, you know, because the more annoying you are, eventually they'll say, you know what? All right, let me get this guy a contract so he can stop bugging me. It's okay to be uncomfortable. Put yeah. Yourself, put yourself in situations where you're uncomfortable. And send them friendly emails. Keep them updated on what you're doing with your business and let them know in that email that you're looking forward to working with them on larger business opportunities and just be prepared to be able to do it. It's one thing to market yourself and tell them that you're ready, and it's another if your business is not ready. Right. So yeah. you gotta make sure you have that balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello everyone, thank you for being here so much. This has been tremendous. Um, my name is Nia Perry. I'm actually founder of Gradients Global Collective, a new media company. I'm actually also host of the Gradient Global Collective podcast, and we spot black women entrepreneurs globally. My question is really not so much trends, uh, because I feel like I'm in a new media space, podcasting space, I feel like I'm on the right track. My question is more, um, so right now I'm really heavily in content creation and brand development. In that process of also building community, like Sequoia so lovely told me the other day to do, um, and also digging into the data, are there ways to, while I'm building the brand, to also begin monetizing without having to wait until, you know, I have it all together, in other words? Yeah. I think um, it's, it's interesting that you asked that question and, and in much in the spirit of, of my, my panelists when they talked about alternative funding approaches. Um, that's essentially what we did is we took our network 
and we built a product around it. So we are a service company, but we have a product, which is the Culture and Code Tour. So <clears throat> we went to Miami and Uber came with us, uh, Magic Johnson came with us, and we actually leveraged our relationships, but we also leveraged the experience of seeing Miami differently and really built it out as a product. And so now, um, you know, while we were you know, gaining contracts from big brands, we actually thought about productization of um, what you probably would call marketing. Yeah. Um, but I was like, I don't really do things for free. So we actually built out a model where um, I invested a little, but I also built a piece of media um, that could be um, you know, leveraged for partnerships. So now, we're, we're, now we have brand, so it, it's something you would do. I do dinners all the time. I'm sort of known in Los Angeles for doing these amazing dinners. And I put people together and I use sort of Jeffersonian dinner meets Stanford Design Thinking and create these amazing opportunities. That's actually a product that we now, okay. um, w brands come to us because we actually know how to connect people. Okay. So each of the chunks of my business that, like I, I, I call it paid business development. Like I never, I, I get paid to do business development yeah. and I never spend my own money because I can productize that okay. um, part of the experience. I'm get, I hope the doors are closed too. I'm giving you like all my good things. Um, <laughs> but it, it's also like, it's, it's critical to build relationships. It's critical to gather people, but it's also something that other people could leverage. And in your business, you're in the podcasting world, you're talking to people through podcasting and through media, but you also have a network. And so how you leverage that network could be a short-term financing opportunity okay while you're building the other pieces of the business. That's just one thought. Thank you. I also thought, um, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, which, which is very much of a trend as well, um, around business and like different interest levels. And what I've seen people do also is kind of leverage, like let's say you're talking about uh, a black woman who's you're, you're interviewing and they have a product or something. They can also start to like, you can advertise through your channel and ask them to you know, give a, a spiel or a pitch while you're kind of um, talking to your audience. I've seen that a lot, like stay tuned for, you know, you know, a break for our sponsors, right, type of thing. And you can even start small. It's like, hey, do you wanna be on our next, spot? you know, cast it for the next month of our sponsors and have them do a prepaid package? I, I think that's a great, because you have an audience that's, that's listening to your podcast. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so good afternoon. I'm I'm at this conference wearing a couple of hats. I'm Dr. Uh, David A. Padgett. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I've owned a uh, ge geospatial information technology company called GeoMental for the past 25 years. Uh, Black Enterprise has been one of my past clients. Uh, I'm also a full-time faculty member at one of our HBCUs, Tennessee State University. Uh, and the Tennessee State University, along with 23 other HBCUs, is part of a, an investment by the uh, Lilly Corporation to close, among other things, the tech gap mm -hmm. uh, between our graduates and other graduates. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard a lot of interesting things on the stage that made me get up with my educator's hat. Is normally the first thing I do when I come in class, I say, put your phones away. I don't want to see them until the end of the class ever, really. And, and part of it is age. I mean, I don't have an iPhone, I have the F phone. You know, my <laughs> free, free phone. <laughs> My students ask me all the time, is that a pager? Is that a pager? Like, no. Um, so I love it. <laughs> I've heard a lot of interesting things because we have a dilemma. A, in the classroom setting, those devices are distractions. Mm. You know, I tell my students, I hope whoever's on Snapchat is going to give you a grade in this class. That's, that's where they are, but that's where they are. Uh, but do you see that a lot of the innovations and trends uh, for those of us who are educating the next generation of innovators. Uh, is, is that something that we should leave outside of the formal classroom setting as we do now? Or is, it, is there some kind of a way uh, that we can take 18 and 19 and 20 year olds who are totally distracted by these devices and actually create career opportunities and career preparation that would close that tech gap? I mean, mm -hmm. Is that even possible? Yeah, I, it's an interesting um, thing that you pose. I, I have a college graduate just graduated uh, last weekend, and Congrats. I'm also on the board of the University of Miami where he was, where he was attending um, the music program. Uh, I have a real challenge with academia. Um, I find a lot of uh, uh, the staff to be out of touch and not connected to where the, where the hockey puck is going. Um, I actually think that 
you may want to figure out just in your own classroom, I understand how the phones can be distracting, but you're going to create a barrier between what they're hearing by, by not allowing them to play in the spaces they play in. You will not connect with them on a level, in a language, in a nomenclature that they understand if you're asking them to put away their phones. And, and, and so we have to figure out ways to meet them where they are. Um, and I do agree it has to happen out in the classroom and outside the classroom. I've had the fortune of working with UNCF on taking um, HBCU students to Silicon Valley and Facebook and, and Google. And um, I think that it's about getting out of the classroom and, and, and doing a couple things. One, showing our kids um, actually how the game is played, right? So it, it, exactly what she was talking about. Like I live in that game of Silicon Valley and how companies are funded and how it actually happens and how there's syndicates that actually fund companies. And, um, and so that's really important for our kids to understand in the world of Silicon Valley. But even if you were looking to become an engineer at a Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so forth, just the importance of, of building great relationships, um, but in our community specifically, again, making yourself uncomfortable and putting yourself in positions where, you know, it really it, it's uncomfortable. Even down to what we dress, like we're way overdressed sometimes in, in meetings, way overdressed. Like we culturally look off, right? And so I think there's an entire thing I want to do with, with kids that are coming out of HBCUs specifically, because I think all the innovation is in our schools. Uh, we have great minds, but we are not packaging them correctly. We are not um, embracing uh, the, 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 the way that they communicate, and we've created this generational barrier um, that we have to fix and solve, because you're just gonna lose more kids who are gonna be uninterested in pursuing something. And we have kids that are graduating with CS degrees who are driving Uber, and that's a problem. Because men, many of whom can't write code, and, and didn't come out of that for institution writing, being able to write code that these companies uh, are looking for. And so, I think it has to happen as a partnership between the university and outside the university. In Atlanta, we did a lot of that. We were partnering with Morehouse and Spelman. I funded an internship program at Spelman on my own. And so I think it has to, you have to look in, in at TSU, in these communities, to find those partnerships that work both outside and inside. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. There needs to be an integration. Um, you know, my partner who helps with the creation of MWB Connect, you know, is in her 20s. I'm in my 40s. So, you know, the disparity between the two of technology versus old tradition, you know, we went through that back and forth on how to make the app work. You know, I had technological background, you know, but she had more of a coding and development background. You know, so the two of us merging together were able to create this incubative, you know, innovation of this app. And if the schools and universities are not merging and talking to these kids, right. they're going to lose out totally. on brilliant minds. When you think about you know, overseas, what the kids in Japan are doing, the kids in China are doing, they have integrated you know, the technology, the technological world into their everyday life of education. And that's what's helping them to create, you know, sets a lot of STEM and STEAM programs over there that they're now bringing here to the states. So I think we need to do a little bit of a better job of the STEM and STEAM programs here to be able to help our children be able to develop those type of mindsets so that they can take those innovations and creations that they have in their head and actually put them into their hands. I also think you could like ask the students, like, because they're probably involved in some way of how they incorporate and get information in the first place. So, I mean, if you don't have that big budget to like do smart boards or anything like that, figure out ways to incorporate them how they like to learn, which is through technology. So, whether it's doing breaking out in groups and figuring out ways they can like build a, an app to, because it's really easy to kind of do things nowadays with you know, access to information um, or build something that is centered around your curriculum um, that leverages technology in a new, unique way and have them actually get it and see if it works, right? Like test them after that and see if they're getting majority of them passing over it. So I think that's a good way of kind of trying new ways of teaching or innovating through, um, through the lesson. Thank you. Great. We're running short on time. I think we have three questions left, so we're going to give you guys each a minute. So that means you get 10 seconds to ask it, and you guys get like 50 to answer it. All right? Go ahead. 
Hi, my name is Lee Johnson. I run a business uh, consulting company that actually uh, is starting to get into offshore IT uh, services. So my question is, given the current climate where you know, we're trying to buy American, do you see that being an issue uh, in the future? Do you see that being sustainable in the future, especially with governments and local governments? Um, mm. Are you telling them that your company's off seas? Uh, well, we have. We Are have you, do we you have, have a base in the states? Yes, we do have okay, a base in the states. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, if your base is in the state, so what exactly is overseas? Nigeria. Mm. A little bit of a tough one there. Um, IT is, is, is a tricky area because of the fact that you know, the way telecommunications and all the hacking and stuff that's going on. Um, I would definitely say, if you can, tailor and market the business so that you're saying the focus is here with only a small portion of it being from overseas. I, I, I disagree, let me take a different point. Okay. I actually okay. think that we need to think about long term, mm -hmm. not where we are right this minute. Okay. And I actually think that there's too much talent coming out of the continent, there's too much opportunities outside of America for what you're doing. And while the sentiment in our country by the current president is um, by American, you're an American entrepreneur um, who's built a company leveraging the resources and talents in a global economy. And while this is the short-term sentiment, I don't think it'll be the long-term play. We can't, you know, we can't sustain it. And I wouldn't get freaked out by what could seemingly feel like um, a disruptive um, uh, message point for your business. And I think you, you need to think especially at where the hockey puck is going, and you know for a fact uh, what's happening in the market, um, what's happening on the continent specifically, and I think it's really important to stay the course. Um, but maybe to, 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 to your point, like how do you repackage a little bit of, mm -hmm. of, of how you present your company? Right. Um, but I think the talent, the growth, the opportunities of, of everything you're doing, stay the course, but, but think about how you can, um, how you can sort of re-message it a little bit. But, but, but it by no means do not um, forego opportunities that are, that are outside of the Oh no, I wasn't saying forego. What I was just saying is just the repackaging of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And plus, they're all doing it. Yeah, they're all doing they're it. They're all it. doing yeah. it. So, the, like, yeah. if they tell you that, they're lying. Yeah. <laughs> because they're all, all by the line. Everybody has an offshore team. Exactly. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Misty Starks. Uh, I own Misty Blue Media and 3B Resources Group Public Relations. And my question is where do you see um, VR going in the future? Particularly, how can we as small business owners? get on that path now when we see that it's going to be the wave of the future. It's expensive now, but how can we kind of get into that space? Mm, well, it's a yeah. space that I know well. We've invested in it. I started a company and we started doing consulting in VR and AR, um, and I was early. Um, it is, it's early. <laughs> um, the problem is the devices. The problem is cumbersome devices. As soon as, soon as the, the ability to kind of use this as your as VR, I think it'll be amazing. I do, however, think you should pay close attention. I think you're thinking about it the right way. I think that you need to think about, um, and I don't know who your clients are, but for those clients who want an immersive experience, um, who want to tell a story in a really unique way, it's perfect right now. But the problem is, is the install base is so low. People, I mean, how many people here have, I'm just curious, who has a Samsung gear? Anybody? Okay, so three, four people, okay. Um, but in, in the fields of where, where I, I do see exciting opportunities is, um, so we work with a sports team to actually help them think about um, selling the uh, real estate experience of the box seats. I think in the areas of real estate, I think in the areas of, of education, I think there's some real opportunities. Um, so find your unique niche that's kind of trending right now. And um, there's some great, especially in LA, there's some great VR content creators. And you might be able to actually figure out how you found a niche and you offshore your resources, maybe outside of the, of the, of the city that you live in and look for those markets where there, there's, there's, there's talent. I'll give you one for free. In, in Atlanta, there's uh, 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 um, Georgia State has, I think, an untapped gold mine 
and kids coming out of Georgia State, which is, is one of the bigger schools in Atlanta, um, that I think is, is untapped in terms of creators of potential VR. I was trying to position a client, a big Fortune 500, to look at it from that perspective. I think Atlanta is a great place just because of the of Georgia Tech, um, Georgia State kind of connection, where there's a bunch of kids who are really um, thinking about VR, but they don't have someone like you that can sell it. So put them in your satchel, put them in your quiver, and figure out how you can um, you can actually sell it with maybe folks who are dabbling with it. Um, but yeah, it's a big bet. Right now, it's, 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 it's really being used in bad ways. I think it's like people are using it at trade shows to like be cute, and I think yeah. it's really whack. <laughs> it's so and so sad. I'm looking forward to the, the more um, immersive, more impactful usages of VR. And I think that you, know, you can be ahead of the trend by figuring out how to not lose your shirt and lose money uh, chasing it, so. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dr. Devin Miles. I'm owner of It's Time Natural Health, in which I utilize natural therapies to help heal the body. Um, well, I need you to say this really yeah, 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 yeah. Slower. slower. First your oh. name. I'm Devin Miles. Got it. And I'm a doctor who utilizes natural therapies to help heal the body. And my business is It's Time Natural Health. But my question has nothing to actually do with that. Um, I uh, am halfway introvert, halfway extrovert. I have like multiple parts of my personality here. And then, so there's another side of me that's way more of a doer than a talker. And so when I've had to, this is like new for me is this, this medical side, but before that I was in banking. And so um, throughout all of that, networking has been something that's kind of been pulled out of me and forced, and I still f somewhat force it. Um, so when it comes to uh, talking to someone about a government contract, or talking to someone about government, knowing that actually I want a contract, but maybe that's only three years down the line, and right now all I have to do is call somebody to the government and say, hey, I want to take you to lunch. That's very, very awkward to my mind. I don't get it, and I don't <laughs> get how to follow through with that and keep that going. So can you talk about how that actually works. Mm. Interesting. So within states, they have expos and they have events where you can meet a lot of these procurement officers. Mm -hmm. So your first encounter starts there, going to their table, introducing yourself, giving them your card and telling them a little bit about your business and then finding out from them what type of business opportunities are available. And make sure you get their name, their phone number, and their email. And then after you're done at that expo, you go home or to your office or wherever you have to go, and you send them a message of saying, it was a pleasure speaking to you today. I really learned a lot from you. I would like to stay in touch. That's the first step. And then you can do a follow-up email saying, I have an additional question. Let's say there was an RFP or a contract that they mentioned that you're really interested in. Send them that second email and say, I'd like to, you know, if possible, sit down with you and have a conversation to get a little bit of better understanding about this contract. Can we do that? And then they'll tell you whether they can or can't. And that starts your relationship with them. And the more conversations you kind of have with them, you know, on those type of levels, it will build you up to have that confidence level, to be able to pick up the phone and say, hi, Sarah, you know, I had a, a, a question, but it's more of an offline question. Can we do lunch? But it takes a while. It, it took me a long time, you know, to be able to get to that level with a lot of them. I know I sound loud and I look like I'm easy going type of person, but trust me, sometimes it's hard for me too. And, you know, it just takes time. And then when you build that confidence level, it, you know, it gets better. It, it'll never be perfect. You'll never be 100% confident because I don't think I'm 100% confident, you know, when it comes to that sometimes, but it gets better. And you just have to pace yourself. Sometimes you won't get people who are as receptive and that's okay, but you just gotta keep going with the next one. And then eventually you will find someone within that space that you can have that conversation with who might be able to help you with a contract, maybe not in their arena, but in another arena, in another agency or another division. Can I answer a question? I heard yeah. you say, um, which is interesting, is like, what's the ROI of networking? Yeah. And like, how do I actually, um, how do I in my head, wow, like I want to take this person to lunch, like, like I don't see the, the, the return on the investment right away, 
And I, I just wanted, for those in the room who are just, you know, maybe struggle with this very same thing, and also the idea of being an extrovert and introvert. There's a TED talk by Susan Cain, who I think is amazing. She wrote a book um, that was fascinating about Because in the same way, I probably seem like an extrovert, but I'm really an introverted socialite. That's actually what I mean. So, um, but I, um, I think that can play I don't to, think to so, your benefit. <laughs> no, I, there's actually no pure, so in the book, Susan Cain's book, there's no pure extrovert or introvert. You're actually in degree. So anyway, but, um, but what I want to say to you about that is really quickly um, is um, what I do when I sit down with people at lunch, um, and I do the same thing for people, is I say, what are th who are three people that I can introduce you to? So I'm, I'm always looking to exchange value, right, in everything that I'm doing. Um, and my network, uh, my network is my net worth. So everything that I do um, in business is a result of having an incredible network. But the incredible network did not come without intentionality, without real strategery around that. And I actually love people, um, but I also love to give to people. So my network is really built on a, on a series of value exchanges. So I have done, and I learned this in the music business because it's like the mob, right? It's like, it's like wow, you know you love favors, right? So I actually love the idea of like giving away my network. I actually love the idea of like, hey, we had lunch together. I know you want to build this company. Um, let me connect you with my boy, or let me connect you with that person. And that's actually the best like lunch date you could ever have is where not only are you getting something, but that you actually have found a way to add value in this person who she mentions life. Like, oh wow, I'm taking you to lunch because you have a, you're a government procurement person. But damn, you like uh, this, and I happen to know someone who does that. And I think that when you look at it from that perspective, you'll find more and more ways that you add value. You don't feel like you're taking, but you're also giving to a relationship. And the last thing I was just going to add is that sometimes it's hard to like even start the conversation. So it's kind of like, yeah, we can get there as soon as I can like say hello. But um, I think one of the, a good hack is complimenting someone. Mm -hmm. That puts them on a good like, hi, <laughs> and then they're like open to what you want to do. It's like, oh my gosh, you have lovely earrings. Where'd you get them from? Flea markets? Oh, you like flea markets. Clue in. <laughs> and then you figure out other ways to kind of connect with them later on. Like, oh, I found this, you know, you know whatever, whatever. Cl connect with them outside of their line of work as well and find those interests where you can kind of connect and um, position yourself so that you can make those introductions or you can you know figure out what you really need to get to get that contract so those those are the things you do outside of the business like just like making sure you're satisfied and all that stuff um, certified and all that stuff it's just like connecting on a human level so that I think that would be really helpful just compliment the hell out of them <laughs> and they'll always love you <laughs> and you'd be surprised a lot of them are talkers they love to talk mm -hmm. so just be prepared that you got to stand there for a bit and listen to them talk <laughs> take the information down while they're talking <laughs> yeah all right guys <laughs> thank you perfect so thank you so much this panel was incredible i hope you guys got a lot of great information <laughs> all right and you know, people have to run off and do other things but some of the other panelists will stick around so if you want to speak to them you guys can go ahead and do that thanks guys thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.